You're listening to What Mad Universe on the Greenlit Podcast Network. Check out all our shows at greenlitpodcast.com. Content warning. Slavery, genetic engineering, anti-Semitism, and I accidentally used an ableist term at one point. Sorry. Action! Excitement! Horror! Mad! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on... What What Mad Universe! Some critics have characterized us of Starfleet as primitives, and with some justification. In some ways, we do resemble our forebears of a couple centuries ago more than we do most people today. We are not part of those increasingly large numbers of humans who seem willing to submerge their own identities into the groups to which they belong. I am prepared to accept the possibility that these so-called new humans represent a more highly evolved breed, capable of finding rewards in group consciousness, that we more primitive individuals will never know. For the present, however, this new breed of human makes a poor space traveler, and Starfleet must depend on us primitives for deep space exploration. I have always found it amusing that my academy class was the first group selected by Starfleet on the basis of somewhat more limited intellectual agility. It is made doubly amusing, of course, by the fact that our five-year mission was so well documented due to an ill-conceived notion by Starfleet that the return of the USS Enterprise merited public notice. Unfortunately, Starfleet's enthusiasm affected even those who chronicled our adventures and we were all painted somewhat larger than life, especially myself. Eventually, I found that I had been fictionalized into some sort of modern Ulysses, and it has been painful to see my command decisions of those years so widely applauded, whereas the plain facts are that 94 of my crew met violent deaths during those years, and many of them would still be alive if I had acted either more quickly or more wisely. Nor have I been as foolishly courageous as depicted. I have never happily invited injury. I have disliked in the extreme every duty circumstance which has required me to risk my life. But there appears to be something in the nature of depictors of popular events, which leads them into the habit of exaggeration. As a result, I became determined that if I ever again found myself involved in an affair attracting public attention, I would insist that some way be found to tell the story more accurately. Spin-offs. The Final Frontier. These are not the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. At least, not the officially sanctioned ones. But after Star Trek was cancelled at the end of the 60s, despite an impassioned fan campaign that gave them an unexpected third season, Trek lived on for a decade or more in novels, comics, zines, and dozens of unproduced scripts before finally returning to the big screen in 1978. During this time, Trek was essentially kept alive by the fans, but a lot of the material generated ended up diverging heavily from what eventually made it onto the screen. But one novel, despite being non-canonical, has had a tremendous impact on Star Trek. That novel is The Final Reflection by John M. Ford. Hi, Kapla, and welcome to a new What Mad Universe, another in our series looking at spin-off novels from various media adaptations on the show that examines pulp and the roots of pop culture in genre fiction. With me, as always, is Philip Rice. <laughs> Sorry, something in my throat. Hi. Uh, hi, Phil. Uh, and we're joined today by a special guest, Dylan Roth, uh, who he wrote the Infinite Diversity column at Dead Shirt, and uh, he's written about Star Trek in a number of other places, including Fanbyte. Hi, Dylan. Great to have you on the show. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. So, uh, yes, as, uh, as we did with Star Wars a while back, uh, we're doing sort of a series where we look at the various uh, spinoffs and weird little, uh, little uh, cul-de-sacs that exist uh, when... Popular media <laughs> uh, creates uh, novelizations, comics, and all kinds of other spin-offs. And Star Trek was especially interesting, I think, to me, uh, because it was really kept alive by the fans for about a decade. Um, 
before it got a movie. I mean, there was an animated series, of course. But um, And as I say, these were licensed adaptations, but there was a very strong fan crossover. And it seems as though Paramount, who owned Star Trek at that point, uh, didn't want, and still does, uh, didn't want, didn't uh, mind too much if people sort of went their own way. They didn't care that much about canon and so on. Um, so this novel, The Final Reflection, which uh, came out in uh, 1984, I believe, uh, after the movies, actually, but it was still part of that um, that area. Um, Dylan, uh, you had mentioned to me that you were more of a sort of a next generation era person, as am I, is that correct? Well, yeah, I grew up in the 90s for the most part, and that um, and that was in the position where the new Star Trek that was coming out was the Rick Berman era Star Trek. Next Generation, D Space Nine, Voyager, and eventually Enterprise, which I watched as a teenager. Um, so, but I, I also always had a connection with the original series. My father and my, my parents both uh, were, were Star Trek viewers uh, when, they were, when they were younger in the 60s or in the original mm -hmm. airing. We had a lot of videotapes, uh, laser discs, and eventually uh, DVDs of, 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 of classic episodes, and I was the kind of Star Trek kid who got really into the reference materials. <laughs> like, I had the Mike, Oku Mike and Denise Okuda, like, uh, chronology and encyclopedia books. I was, honestly, I, I think I read more about this era of Star Trek than I watched for a, a lot of my developmental years, but... Uh, I would say I am I'm very well versed in the eventual Klingon culture that emerged out of um, I'm getting ahead of myself. We haven't talked about the Klingons. Yes. Well, um, that is the interesting thing because there are <laughs> the argument over what is the Klingon culture. That's part of what we're looking at here today. But uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Like I Star Trek, I guess was on TV and reruns when I was growing up, like the, the original, I mean, but uh, I wasn't that interested in it, but they had Star Trek books at school. And if they didn't have next generation stuff, I'd read the old stuff. <laughs> right. And they had sort of uh, these Star Trek log books. I actually read when I was a kid, uh, which adapted various episodes and, Spock Must Die mm -hmm. by James Blish, which is the first novel. Um, and, uh, but, and there were a few other novels kicking around. But uh, yeah, that was, it was, I, I, I think that might be something for our generation that we experienced a lot of it through, through text, as, <laughs> through novelization as much as, as that stuff. Yeah, it was just more um, accessible at the time you, than, the, than the shows were. Because like you, you could catch it in syndication and there were a lot of tape trades. But, you know, if you were, if you were like, you know, 10, 11 years old. How many? How what's the likelihood that you're gonna you're gonna know somebody who's got a, a, a copy of the Alternative Factor from 19, you know, 67 that they can loan you to make a copy of? Right? You have to have great initiative and access. So it was it was like school libraries for a, a lot of it. This was the case for me and Star Wars as well, where like, oh, they have the visual encyclopedia from you know uh, from like uh, the mid 90s that had all of this pre prequels um, backstory that got overwritten or in in the case of Star Trek, uh, you could you could find novels that like kind of sort of maybe did count at your local library, and that was a way to have Star Trek on demand, uh, and and way mm -hmm. more than you could possibly know what to do with because they've been making the novels since the uh, since basically around the time the show was on. Uh, Philip, what 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 was uh, did you have any kind of exposure to the to the original series specifically? Did you? Yeah, ever... yeah, I watched um, the original series was on the Space Network when I was a kid. Um, I guess, um, or like, uh, 10 to teenage years that it was on in syndication. Uh, I watched it all the time, but there's a bunch of episodes that I realize now I haven't seen or don't remember. It seemed to repeat a lot of the, uh, um, maybe it's just ones that stuck in my mind, in my memory. Uh, the ones I remember most tended to be like the, like they'd go to the Roman planet or the gangster <laughs> planet or the Nazi <laughs> planet, uh, yeah. that, um, None of which seem to exist outside of the original series. Oh. Yeah. Though, well, uh, that, that was an excuse to reuse all the costumes that they yeah, had yeah. on the Paramount. <laughs> they have the holodeck for that now. But uh, Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And I, I watched uh, The Next Generation as well. That, that was on. Um, I, I'm not as big a Star Trek person as either of you two uh, by far. Uh, I haven't seen all the series. Um, I mean, every episode of all the series. Um but uh, I, I've always liked the idea of it, you know, like the the, um, the concepts and the, the setting. Um, haven't liked every uh, iteration. Um, really don't like Voyager or what I've seen of Enterprise. But uh, um, I, I do like uh, the, the original series setting. Um, 
the um, Next Generation stuff. Um, I've been liking the new shows. I know they're pretty controversial, but I've been watching those. Yeah. Uh, Discovery and Picard. And, uh, yeah, they, I mean, as they're... Re- Sorry. That's fine. As, they're as good as anything, you know? Like, they, there's, they, they have their ups and downs. It's, it's funny yeah. because Discovery's been racked with a lot of turmoil behind the scenes, and yet... You know, if you go back and look at Next Generation, it was racked with turmoil behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And you go back yep. and look at the original series, and it was racked with turmoil yeah, behind the scenes. They were, the all, they were all like that. So every new iteration of Star Trek, um, I don't know if this was the case with the first movies. Especially the motion picture, I think, was, for fans, it was considered unimpeachable because Gene Roddenberry wrote it and produced it. But as mm-hmm. far back as Star Trek II, which almost any fan today will hold in the highest regard, right? has been dismissed upon release as not really Star Trek. Um, This is not a new phenomenon. It's certainly a little bit of an uglier phenomenon now, uh, considering the element that tends to be the loudest in dismissing shows like, uh, particularly Discovery. Um, The the fans that somehow are are obtuse enough to uh, accuse Discovery and Picard of being like SJW garbage or whatever, as if it hasn't always been that. Um, Yeah. And, uh, but it's, but it has always happened. Yeah. I, I really, really wonder really... what these, Sorry, go ahead. I, I really wonder what, uh, those people would think of if they came out with, you know, the one where Frank Gorshin is half black and half white, if they came out with something like that today. Well, the thing oh, is, it's too like... subtle a metaphor for them. <laughs> they wouldn't get it. It's, it's I mean, shocking. They, but they, they accept that because it's, it's, they grew up with it. Like it's, it's right. grandfathered in, but if you came yeah. up with something that blatant now, uh, they, um, right. and part of also the motivation behind, not focusing on the same species in addition to trying to open up new avenues for telling stories about new cultures and new ideas and new political allegories was the idea that I think is very central to Star Trek, which is that your enemy today will not be your enemy forever. And Gene Roddenberry wanted to avoid a slew of scripts about, oh, the Klingons are making trouble again. And uh, one, one version of mythology, and you have to take everything that Gene Roddenberry said about his own career in life with a grain of salt, because he was a huge <laughs> Bob Dylan scale self mythologizer. But <laughs> yep. um, was that he was Stanley receiving... level? Yes, exactly. It was the kind of thing. Gene Roddenberry never did a bad thing in his life if you ask Gene Roddenberry. Uh, and <laughs> and there's there's a lot like even even in the even in the widely accepted mythology of Star Trek, like the idea that it was supposed to get canceled after its second season and was saved by fan letters. The fan letters were real, and and B. Joe Trimble's campaign was real and really did have an impact, but uh, there's no paperwork at NBC to suggest they were ever planning to cancel the show in the second season. There was an unattributed uh, newspaper article from, like, a New Hampshire newspaper that said that the show was on the chopping block, and that that got the the fans going and and got, uh, like, Roddenberry was rallying the fans. It it likely would have gotten renewed anyway. Um, but huh. it's very important to the, according to the, at least this one article that I was that I was reading that was like going through it in kind of a very production way. It wasn't like a Star Trek fan site. It was like a NBC production journal type website, <laughs> which is, I can trust okay. a lot more because they don't give a shit about Star Trek, right? Um, right, interesting. But the idea okay. that that Gene Roddenberry and the Star Trek fans were part of this enormous insurgency against the man at NBC is mm-hmm. is true, but not as true as he says it. So. Anything yeah, that comes I, from I, him, you have to kind of take a grain of salt. But the way that he talked about the decision to add Worf was that he was tired of getting spec scripts or pitches early on in the process about the Klingons making trouble. And so he figured that in order to just get this whole idea off the board is say, well, there's a Klingon on the bridge now. Uh, we're not going to be fighting the Klingons anymore. There's a detente. Okay, let's move on and do new things. And then as you say, just going back to what you're saying about Roddenberry, too, I, I know that he had a tendency, he really knew how to work the fans, clearly. Oh boy, um, did he. It was said that Gene Roddenberry was always jealous that L. Ron Hubbard was the one who got the cult. <laughs> <laughs> and that he would, like, vocally say this to people. It's like, why don't I have a cult? I'd be better at it. <laughs> really? Well, he kind of did. He wasn't, yeah. he, he's, he got pretty close. But this is, I mean, this is also, you know, sort of that sort of hearsay mythology, where it's the kind of thing that people will say about him, and it not, I don't believe he's ever been on record complaining, but I, uh, I, 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 it is a story that gets passed around. Well, I can believe he. I mean, he wasn't devoid of a sense of humor. I, he mm-hmm. may have been joking when he said something like that. He but, may well have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That sounds that sounds like the kind of thing. But I do know that, um, for instance, um, like there, there's a point of divergence, which is going to what we're kind of talking about um, when 
the motion picture, as you said, it came out. It was Roddenberry was involved top to bottom. He wrote the novelization, which is actually what I quoted that opening sequence from. And you can see, like, because there's an introduction, quote written by Captain Kirk, in which he says, um, uh, you know, oh, by the way, the the the, the show that you see uh, isn't really what happened. There's there's that's actually just a you know, it's a Rashomon kind of thing. <laughs> uh, what really happened is a little different. And he tries to literally rework retcon star trek mythology into this very strange thing about uh how there are superhumans who uh run earth who are a, like a hive mind and there's all these weird ideas in there um and then motion picture came out it was all involved with Roddenberry. people generally seem to feel that he unfortunately dragged it down a bit he, he was a little taking everything too seriously and it could have used more humor and adventure uh, and so as a result, my understanding is he was shuffled aside a bit for the second movie. And that's when Roddenberry started to like whip up the fans to say, oh, as you say, Star Trek 2, oh, that's not real Star Trek. Oh, and did you know Spock's going to die in this one? What a horrible thing. A, get a fan campaign going to, <laughs> to, to shut down Star Trek 2, as is my understanding. That's about where it um, started, yeah. Uh, the idea basically was that despite, it, despite its financial success, uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture was kind of a, a it was considered to have critically un underperformed and commercially underperformed a little bit. It was a very, very expensive film. Um, and the, and Paramount had the, the sort of the legal leverage over him as the IP owners to kick to the, the phrase is usually used kicked upstairs, uh, to become a, right. uh, a consulting producer, uh, as, essentially an honorific uh, with no creative actual power. And they handed the franchise to a, a TV producer named Harv Bennett, uh, who was who was charged with um, trying to sustain the film series on a much lower budget and trying to, ironically, try to capture more of what people liked about the show by eliminating the guy who made the show. Uh, <laughs> and it's not as it, it turned out to work, right? Uh, the next film, you know, he got Nick Meyer, who he asked, uh, "Hey, can you make this movie for a third of uh, of what we made the original motion picture for?" He's like, "I can make you three movies with that money." And uh, more or less did. Uh, Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 were, were both relatively low-budget affairs, and they right. performed better. Um, yeah. Star Trek 2 being, like, considered the er example of a great Star Trek movie by like, most yep. fans and casual viewers. Yeah. And and to the point where almost every movie for the last uh, <laughs> few has been trying to remake it. Yeah, yep. yeah. They keep going back to that well. And, Phil, that reminds... Like, remember what we, when we looked at Star Wars... Uh, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. That's that. It's almost like the the scenario they envisioned for Star Wars happened for Star Trek. Like uh, that they said, yeah. oh, we'll get a ch we'll make a cheap we'll knock off a cheap version of a sequel if we don't get enough money to make the the, the top the first one, right? Yeah. So um, so I uh, I just want to take a break here uh in uh to let people know that in exciting news uh we've recently joined the greenlit podcast network which means we're going to take a break for the first time ever for a word from our sponsors there are a lot of podcasts with comic book reviews and interviews with some of the greatest creators in the industry but only one will tell you scientifically what the worst comic book of all time is and the best we've been ranking comic book stories for six years we have a list with over a thousand comics on it and we're adding more every month more rocket ajax on the greenlit podcast network Video Death Loop is a podcast where we watch a short video clip on loop until we just can't take it anymore. Along the way, we'll try our best to make each other laugh and to hold out longer than the other guy. You can jump in on any episode, no need to worry about continuity. Check out Video Death Loop on the Greenlit Podcast Network with new episodes every Friday. Now, so, okay, so to go back to the original series, one of the things I really enjoy about the original series and what makes it fascinating when we talk so much about canon as being, like, for a long time, Star Trek was the show that people were obsessed with the canon of Star Trek. It was, oh, this was how it was, and, you know, and it's funny because the original series not only contradicts itself and then what came later, they contradict themselves and then the movies and Next Generation and they all <laughs> contradict themselves, but also the original series, you can really read it as all these people in the writing rooms are arguing with each other because even <laughs> thematically and politically there, you'll get one episode that seems like it's yay the vietnam war is awesome and then the next one's like no the vietnam war is terrible like literally at what the federation is and what starfleet is in relation to our current society 
shifts very heavily. As I say, Errand of Mercy has um, Starfleet is very like if you read it one way, it's Starfleet is Space America, and uh, and and it's and it's almost like a metaphor for. Um, if you read it, you know, without the allegory, it's, it's, oh, uh, don't fight back when, uh, evil, uh, evil conquerors take, try to take you over, be pacifist and just, just go with it, which is a bad message. But if you read it as Kirk is space, uh, America, and he's doing a CIA op to overthrow this country and the, and the Klingons of the communists coming in to, uh, to invade it, then it, it, it reads as, and they all get clowned by the Organians. It reads <laughs> as like counter propaganda almost to, I, to the American imperialism. I love the thing yeah. about Errand of Mercy is an episode in which Kirk gets so pissed off by pacifists that he invents terrorism. <laughs> and yep. <laughs> it's, uh, but but see, but you're right. The original series is really wildly inconsistent in in a way that I think a, that fans today would would not tolerate. Right? Uh, yeah. It, it's the 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 name of Spock's species changes. <laughs> That's right. Like he's a Vulcanian for the first like 14 <laughs> episodes, and like are they an Earth ship? What's what is Starfleet? What's the Federation? The United Federation of Planets? Yep. The United Earth Space Probe Agency? Um, or administration. There's the um, what year is it? Uh, right. Or century, right? How long has it been since the viewer? They don't establish what century Star Trek takes place in until on, on screen until the opening like crawl or like caption on Star Trek Two in nineteen eighty in nineteen eighty two. So like it's the kind of thing where the expectations, the weird things that Star Trek fans are known for, known for obsessing over. It's crazy that a lot of them do date back to this period of time where this book was created, where there was very mm-hmm. little Star Trek coming out, and all fans had was these was the ability to watch the same seventy nine episodes and these bo- and read these books over and over and over and obsess about them as if they're real history, despite the fact that they are they don't work together a lot of the time. They don't they don't make the shape of a shared universe that we're the way that we're accustomed to today and the way that Star Trek fans got used to in the 90s mm-hmm. once you had a firmer guiding hand to what did and didn't count and like an army of story editors and people like Mike and Denise Okuda who would make these official reference materials to which the writers could refer and, and and that's what makes it interesting to me. I really like that about the show that it is that divergent and and that you can and it, like that actually helps resolve a lot of the issues people might have with the Federation because it of course we like Star Trek because we look at fe- the Federation as this uh, oh it's this great happy paradisical society but again it is also very clearly meant to be space America a lot of the times and when you just say well it's America but in space well then all these problems start to come up <laughs> and just to per- portray it as you know a, a utopia then you start to have problems so and the and the points of diversion between federation and america aren't always as strong as we'd like them to be but if you consider that the show is constantly critiquing and and analyzing and deconstructing itself then you then it starts to be okay because a lot of the time it is commenting on and criticizing america and even the federation as we say Aaron of mercy you know the Federation gets clowned. Every so often, Kirk would get <laughs> made to look to little look a little silly, but not even Kirk, but the Federation. The admirals were usually jerks. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there were a lot of problems with the Federation within the TOS and even TNG area era. It's just the general sense of yeah, but we did resolve the material problems of sometimes, the human race at least. Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes uh, there's, yeah. <laughs> I remember um, when we did um, uh, Norman Spinrad. Spin, Spinrad? Um, when uh, yes, the uh, right. Iron Dream, he wrote an episode of uh, TOS, and I watched that. It didn't come up in yeah. in our uh, review of it, but uh, they mentioned we've really earned our paychecks today. Um, yeah, and uh, that yeah. could have been. A, no, there's references. They're not even consistent about whether or what, what kind of economy yeah, exactly. they have, and th- and that problem right. continues even through the um the the Berman era to a degree, because mm-hmm. like there's nothing there's nothing in the original series to suggest that they're in a post. A, a completely post scarcity um, sort of space communism, cosmic, space communist society. And um, the difficulty that, becomes that, like, are apart from very abstract truisms, like we no longer have prejudice. Like, cool, sounds cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, or we no longer have greed. Then, uh, then we don't. They don't really get into much detail as to. Okay, yeah, but how did you? How did you do it? How did you get there? What? Mm-hmm. What? What can we do at home in order to? 
like <laughs> in order to try and reach the thing that you've achieved. Um, in, and and, right. and it's it's very very vague. In uh, because if they knew, so, I, I guess we'd do it. Exactly. If they knew, we'd do uh, it. In the final reflection, <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, in the final saying, reflection, Phil? there's explicitly money. They talk about there's rich people. There's um, mm-hmm. there's a bellboy expecting a tip at one point. Um, so yeah, it's it's yeah. explicitly a capitalist yep. economy in um, in the um, ju- it takes yeah. place forty years before um, TOS. So it's um, yeah. Well, let's yeah. talk about it, Phil. Why don't okay? So why don't we uh, why don't we talk about the specific book that we're going to be talking about this week? Um, it's it's written by a guy called uh, John M. Ford, who uh, is goes from being like he his career really ranged. Um, uh, widely, he died in 2006. Uh, he wrote everything from like science fiction that's actually pretty well regarded, and a lot of people feel that he should be included in the canon of serious science fiction writers, uh, like a proto cyberpunk novel called uh, Web of Angels. Uh, he won the Philip K. Dick Award for another book called uh, Growing Up Weightless. Uh, but then he did everything from um, uh, RPG supplements, including Star Trek ones, and that's actually what got him the job uh, to write a Star Trek spin-off novel, which is the novel we're talking about, The Final Reflection. And he did a lot of work uh, in the 70s and then early 80s on the Klingons uh, for that exact reason. So, uh, Phil, why don't you tell us a bit about this okay. novel? Uh, well, um, I had no idea what it was going in. Uh, you, you recommended it, and there's a Klingon on the cover, so I figured they were involved, but it's from the point of view of Klingons. Uh, for the most part, except for mm-hmm. a framing story with uh, Kirk and Spock uh, reading the book. So it's a novel in-universe, but a historical one that's mostly based on truth, apparently. Um, uh, though there, it's kind of ambiguous in that regard, well, how much was fictionalized. Um, yeah, um, so uh, it's about a uh, young Klingon named uh, Vren, uh, later Kren, um, and his... Um, uh, he's uh, an orphan initially, and then he's adopted into a um, uh, uh, by a thought admiral who are sort of the. Um, uh, I think they're meant to be strategists, like they're like they, they're yeah, thought yeah. admirals because they do all the tactical planning for the Klingon Empire. Exactly, and uh, they study a uh, version of or Klingon version of chess called Klinza or Klinja. How would you pronounce yeah, Klinza. that? Yeah, Klinza. Yep. Okay, it's. Uh, it's not actually uh, a Klingon, the language that we know, because that was developed later. This is sort of an earlier yeah. version of that. Klingon A, we'll talk about that. It's called Klingon E. Yeah, Klingon E's, which was a phrase used on the uh, on TOS, I recall, in the uh, Tribbles episode. One of the Klingons says, uh, um, "We're doing much better than the Federation. All the all the new planets are learning Klingon E's." <laughs> Which is which is funny, you know. Again, one of those they hadn't developed the whole canon yeah. yet, obviously. Um, yeah, he. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, there's kind of a rough. Uh, go uh, on. Uh, there's there's a rough early version of Klingon in this book, which is not the canon Klingon language, which we all got used to uh, later on. But he, again, he sort of it, it sort of got the ball rolling on. Well, let's create an entire Klingon and, language. So and also but it's, portraying the Klingons yeah, as not just generic bad guys, like they have. Um, right. They have their own ideals, and uh, uh, from their perspective, they're doing the right thing, or, or trying to, anyway. Right. Yeah, of course, it's it's about developing sympathy for the Klingons in and of themselves. Uh, it's it's there's a there's a it's it's about this one guy uh, Vren slash Kren uh, who rises up through the ranks uh, as as an orphan. Uh, he's obsessed uh, with this game that they play, which they also play as like a battle game with with yeah, there live are various action people, versions, but also uh, um, yeah, which are but also a board game, yeah, yeah which is like chess for them. Um, and yeah, and it's about it's and it's interestingly. So here's the thing: uh, it's almost certain, and I believe Ron Moore, who wrote a lot of Next Generation Deep Space Nine, uh, has actually said uh, that he read the book and was inspired by the book. Uh, because and he's the one on screen who did the most to flesh out the Klingons. Uh, so it seems like a lot of these ideas did get uh, shoved into the screen in different forms, well, this the including the fact that the plot of this book has a lot in common with Star Trek VI. Did you find that, Dylan, or am I crazy? I think that the just the idea of a much more sympathetic uh, portrayal of being able to look through the lens of this Klingon culture and be like, well, they... 
they have their own stories and they have their own perspective on here in which the Federation is sort of a potential threat or menace. Uh, I think would be the, 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 the closest tie, although there's also the matter of sort of, sort of a mutually, a, a, a secret cabal of uh, powerful people on both sides of the neutral zone sort of conspiring to perpetuate the violence between them. That's, that's right, the thing. Exactly. I, yeah, I hadn't, you know, honestly, I hadn't even drawn the connection until you said it. Yeah, no, that's well, yeah. Well, it, it's it's essentially the same plot motivator as Star Trek Six, which is that people within the Federation and people within the Klingon Empire go, "Well, peace is lame. Let's have war." And they ironically forge a peace to get a cabal together mm-hmm. to uh, bring both sides to war. And that is the plot of this story. But this is from the Klingon perspective, and you know he ends up foiling it. And again, this is set uh, something to like forty to fifty years before. Uh, before the ac- the events of is the original series, is this the first appearance so- of Kales? Because he's mentioned in this book, and he's oh, he's uh, no. he makes an appearance in the uh, of, of a simulacrum of him makes an appearance in a in a third season TOS episode. Okay, yeah, the Space Lincoln episode. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, there's there's uh, there's that aspect uh, that I honestly think they 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 must have uh, must have fed into uh, writing Star Trek Six. Uh, but there's a bunch of other elements, uh, Klingon language. Um, they refer to the ho- Klingon homeworld as Klinzai uh, instead of Kronos, which came later. And it was apparently um, referred to as Kling on um, uh, TNG a couple times. Yeah, just in this uh, yeah. season one episode where they were still kind of working it out. And I think they drew a, a fair amount, I think, from, from this episode in terms of defining the Klingon culture in that episode. But they talk about the traitors of Kling, which they then retcon to be like, oh, I guess that was a historical city or something on, on Kronos. Right. It's also possible yeah. that, like Earth, it has a number of names. Could be. Right. Well, Ford, uh, I think, uh, has Klin, not Kling, as literally the Klingon word for people or human or Klingons, I guess. Um, it's The Klingons went through uh, a number of different uh, development phases. Uh, and there's sort of, so there's the original series, there's the movie, t- the motion picture, uh, which de- form- formalized how we're, we're familiar with them looking with the forehead ridges and everything. Uh, and then Next Generation, especially the episode Heart of Glory in the first season, which is where they really start. I think that's the one you were just referencing, Dylan, mm-hmm. uh, which, uh, which, which, where they really started to flesh them out as, well, they're obsessed with honor. Uh, they believe in battle. Um, you know, the, they're a little more... The, the Klingons of the original series are a little more... I want to say they're almost. I mean, they're they're pseudo space commies. That's really what they're they're dealing with. Um, whereas later they become more like space Vikings, space samurai, um, and a little more brutally militaristic. And we don't see them as being that sophisticated. This book actually has them as inventing transporter technology before the Federation. Uh, if I read that correctly. Yep. And uh, that- apparently, um, I read um, some background on this. Uh, uh, in this book, the uh, Klingon transporters don't make a noise, and they have a different light, and that's apparently a reference to the fact that the Klingon transporters on an episode of the show didn't have sound in one episode. Oh, okay. So it's okay. like uh, <laughs> there's nods to, to continuity stuff. You know, This book is sort of the start, or an early version of trying to clean up some of the rough edges of the continuity. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And and one of the biggest the biggest things they do is because, of course, at this point, this p- book, like I say, was published after the motion picture. So Klingons had their modern look of having forehead ridges, which, of course, conflicts with the OS episode uh, idea of having no forehead ridges. This book tries to basically clean it up in a fairly clever way, uh, implying that Klingons have basically been genetically... Uh, creating servitor half Klingon races, not just half human, but also half Vulcan and other other mixes. Uh, and you know, of course, those are a lesser species. They even have Vulcans who work as their basically kind of as the like they serve a function within the Klingon Empire. Um, but to to be able to work within the Klingon Empire, I believe they're called Tharavul. Uh, the, the Klingons insist that they basically have an operation that takes away their telepathic ability so they can't spy on the Klingons for the Federation. And the Vulcans are so obsessed with finding out new information and learning about the Vulcans that they decide to go along with this and never report anything that goes on within uh, the Klingon Empire, except maybe keeping it in some archive in, in Vulcan. There's also uh, other that's... non-Klingon races within the Empire who are controlled by the Klingons, right. one of which are called the Wathiki, which seem to be some sort of avian-like they have wings on their backs, but uh, the mm-hmm. uh, servant with wikis are uh, 
have their wings amputated so they can um, move on the uh, uh, a ship through the ship corridors uh, easier. Because their wings. That's something yeah, that I all... appreciated about this uh, interpretation of okay, so the Klingons are an empire and they are considered a conquering empire. But like, all right, so what's happening with the? Apparently, they're good at it, right? What's happening with the with the planets they conquer? Are they just killing everybody? Uh, or mm -hmm. are they doing what conquerors do, which is like exploit and occasionally assimilate? And and this um, and this novel like answers that question, which is like, yeah, they've created servant and slave castes, and they they don't like the terms, but uh, I don't care what what they do or don't like. Um, <laughs> right, so right. it's um, but it's yeah, they, they, the the idea is, of the Klingon Empire being somewhat cosmopolitan, at least in terms of demographics. It's not used very much. It, it's sort of on Discovery. There's that uh, Klingon city with multiple species living on it, but it seems to be right. like a, a slum of the planet. Right. Yeah, and it's it's it is interesting because they're trying to make the whole point of this book. Even within the book, there's a framing story where Kirk learns that people are starting to get more sympathetic towards the Klingons after reading this book because it's becoming a sensation within the Federation. But they're still portrayed as a. Uh, oppressive totalitarian slave society that surveils everything everyone and like there's a lot to not like about the Klingon yeah. society as it's portrayed in this story um including of course the slavery thing unfortunately um yeah I think one it's interesting one, that it's like uh, i'm sorry go ahead uh one aspect that i thought was really interesting about this that i hadn't really thought of before because i'm sort of used to post next generation Klingons is in this they have both a fast life cycle so they age quickly um, and, um, they also tend to die in battle quite young. So it's very rare in, in the universe of this book to see an old Klingon. And of course, uh, in post, uh, uh, TNG stuff, they tend to be longer lived than humans, even the humans of the future. So it's, yeah. it's interesting. And I, I sort of like that idea better. Uh, the idea that they, they tend to die quickly because it sort of goes with the whole ethos of the culture, you know, I die in battle and gloriously and all that. But, yeah. but you like, know, those things was... are born out of like the narrative convenience of, oh, uh, we'd like to do an episode with uh, Kangkor and Koloth on DS9. It's been 120 years since their stories happened or whatever, but we never established how long Klingons lived. So, uh, yeah, right. now yeah. We, we want these guest stars. So they live to be yep. 200. But at the same <laughs> well, time, fair, I, I sort of like this better. Uh, like, I understand. Yeah, it, I, but... I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think it's more interesting for the idea that this this culture that seems to have very much of this uh, better to burn out than fade away culture would be more likely to burn out than fade away. But I mean, it, it's also worth saying that like humans seem to live very long time too. I think the idea that just medical technology has gotten so good, everyone there's no reason not for everyone to live longer. And it needs to be said, of course, in the TNG era, Klingons have been at peace with the Federation for a long time. Um, I mean, of course, there's are still outbursts and there's, they, they still like to fight all the time. But I, I, there is a certain consistency in the idea that um, Klingon's culture has evolved a lot over the centuries that we've seen them. I get very fixated on, there's an Enterprise episode called Judgment, uh, where uh, Archer is actually put uh, on trial by the Klingon Empire, and he meets a guy who is implicitly, he's played by... Um, Oh my god, who played uh, Martok. Yeah. Sorry? J.G. Hertzler. J.G. Hertzler, yeah. Um, he's, he's implicitly meant to be uh, the ancestor of Martok on Deep Space Nine. Um, and uh, he talks about how back at, you know, Klingons, no, we have scientists, we have, you know, researchers and librarians and bureaucrats and all the other stuff. Uh, but this, I'm worried about my people because we're all getting obsessed with marching off to war and fighting and basically becoming fascist it makes me it makes me concerned um you know i don't think we can stay together and this is set you know about 150 years before kirk and that's a very logical progression to like then you can see a militaristic but totalitarian society in kirk's day and then to more almost like a totally collapsed you know uh pirate society in next generation era where they can't keep it up. And then I always like to believe that, you know, when Martok took over the Empire in Deep Space Nine, there was kind of a rebirth of a golden age of Klingons, and maybe they got their, their act together and <laughs> became, a bit more, uh, became a bit more respectable. Yeah. But there is actually a weirdly logical evolution. The, the idea that so. all Klingon jobs, that all Klingons think this way is, um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, no culture could have all warriors. Um, right. Uh, like, you want your bus driver to 
be saying <laughs> this is a good day to die, you know? Um, and it's one of the yeah. single biggest problems with the galaxy as presented in Star Trek is that there are these monocultures that are basically created for narrative convenience, right? Of being able to have, okay, well, if we're going to go to a, a planet and they have a problem that's supposed to represent a problem that contemporary human beings have, let's make that exaggerated. Let's make that their whole deal, right? Okay, so we want to do an episode about, we want to do an episode about um, uh, overpopulation. Okay, so this whole culture is built around the idea uh, of preserving, uh, of, of being like extremely intense pro-lifers. And uh, so that's their entire culture, and that's all they're going to talk about. And all right, how about now we've got this culture, we want to do an episode about racism, so this whole culture is entirely built around racism, right? You know, as right. far as isn't. But it's like, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, but, but the more, t but typically the more time they actually dedicate to a species on Star Trek, the more opportunities there are to develop it, right? Like, even the Vulcans right. were incredibly one note until Enterprise, because the only Vulcan that we spent any time with, like any kind of substantial amount of time throughout the first mm -hmm. 40 years of Star Trek or so, is was right. basically just Spock, and he's even separated himself a little bit from, from Vulcan culture as he has gotten more comfortable with his human side and, and living among humans. It wasn't until yeah, we wanna... had, like, not just to Paul, but, like, constant contact with, like, mm -hmm. Ambassadors of All and the Klingon High Command right. or whatever to get an idea of, oh, here's other things about Klingons. There's more than one attitude they can have, and they have their own political squabbles, and they have their own sort of... Uh, Dis disagreements about value yeah. systems. They have their own little well, that, reformation when they find their holographic Dead Sea Scrolls in season four. So, yeah, that's something actually I wanted to I I, I want to put an asterisk on that because uh, it's true that we didn't get much Vulcan stuff uh, in Next Generation Deep Space Nine Voyager. Although of course there's a Vo Vulcan character on Voyager, but they didn't really do much about Vulcan culture on on Voyager. Um, but I will say this, and it, again tying into the fact that there was so much. Uh, back and forth in the writer's room, I think Vulcans evolved quite a lot over the course of just the original series, because I think Spock was original, like, he was created to be, meet Morp, what is this emotion you call love? Like, that was the idea. He would be just totally dead and emotionless, uh, and which is why they made him half human, so that he could have some emotion. Um, and then as the as they fleshed everything out in the late first and second seasons, they decided that, second season especially, I think, uh, they decided all this other stuff about Vulcans, like the idea that it was more of a, it was a mist, it was a philosophy and a, almost a mystical religion for them, uh, that they would embrace logic, and they and their their culture really did get flushed out a lot. A lot of it actually came from Nimoy, I think. He he was the one who who kind of wanted him, uh, Spock, to be almost like a kung fu master kind of uh, kind of wise wise person. And I like that take on the Vulcans that you see from Nimoy, and you don't see as much later, which is Vulcans aren't just they're arrogant, but it's coming from kind of, well, I have great wisdom and I just wish everyone would be as logical as I am. Why can't you all be logical and then we could be peaceful and have, and prosperity and every, like, they want the best for everyone, right? Whereas Vulcans that we get later tend to be a bit more like just jackals. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the defining characteristic that uh, Vulcans tended to have, and I would apply this to, to Tuvok as well on, on Voyager, is smugness. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and that actually became something that they, they, they had leaned so far into on Enterprise that they had to do a three-part story to undo it. <laughs> <laughs> that they, they, had, they had established right. the, the Vulcans as these sort of uh, killjoys of the galaxy that didn't right. totally line up with what we liked about Spock or even Tuvok later. And then, then that's when they, they had this that sort of reformation, the Kirshara arc, where, hey, do you know that, like, the, the reason why you don't like these Vulcans, whereas you kind of like them later, is because they, they, had, a, they had like sort of a, a, a religious and philosophical revolution in the interim. Right. Yeah, and I, I like that. Like, again, with the, like I say with the Klingons, there is a sense of... Uh, granted, Star Trek's aliens who show up for one episode tend to be very thinly sketched. But when there are aliens that we see over and over again, there's actually a very plot, a believable sense of evolution where, oh yeah, their culture wasn't always the same. If you jump forward 100 years, things have changed. If you jump backward 100 years, mm -hmm. things were in a same different position right now. Same with the Ferengi right as they were developed on DS9. From at the same time, I, I do sort of get annoyed at the, the Klingon redesigns. It's because the makeup improved. That's the reason. Yes, um, yeah. and I well, 100%. Is, <laughs> um, and I yeah. wish. Go ahead, um, sorry, Phil. I, I 
this uh, does, I, I think, it doesn't dwell on it, this book doesn't dwell on that aspect uh, while still bringing it up. And no. I think that's better than doing a whole, I mean, Enterprise did like an episode yeah. on it, right? Or a arc mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't well, think this it is needs the problem because they did because you could just say those are like historical recreations and they didn't have very good makeup, so Right. Well, that's the fascinating thing and we see it right like I say, the intro that I read is opening the door to this. Um, and then of course, as much as we all love Trials and Tribulations on Deep Space 9, it opened it opened Pandora's box mm -hmm. in terms of having them interact with the actual old school Star Trek. A much more logical way of logical, <laughs> haha, way of seeing it is when you go to like the Abrams show and Discovery and other things that are, and even Enterprise, is just to say, look, the filter through which we see these things is through the filter of special effects of the era in which that show is made. And that has improved over the years. So if we go back to Kirk's... Like, it, nobody saw the Abrams movie and went, wait a minute, the Enterprise bridge looks slightly different than it did. Unfortunately, lots of people, people did, did do that, yeah, and that's what that. sucks. Okay. But, but the thing is, uh, I 100% I agree with you. I've actually been trying to pitch around an article tracking, like how Star Trek fans got to be like this. But but that's the only answer that anybody should need, which is that we are now looking at it through different goggles, right? We had our 1966 right. goggles, we had our 1982 goggles, and now we have our 2020 goggles. Like They had a last time on, or previously on Star Trek, and actually used footage from the pilot episode, not even the original right. series, like the Menagerie. And um, then just the faded just into, the you know, the previous, uh, or sorry? The Cage, the cage is the sorry. name of the episode. Wow. Yeah. Um, and faded from the original actor playing Pike to uh, the new actor playing Pike. And just and yeah. it just sort of, um, it seemed to be a signal like, yeah, that, that right. happened, but it, it just, imagine it looked different, you know? Yeah, put on your Yeah, glasses. I love that, going back now to, uh, to the 70s era. Um, like, you have, the, the degree to which Star Trek was... A very much a bridge between the fans and the production, like the the quote official productions, is pretty insane. And like I say, this this novelization, the final reflection, if you consider Ford went from writing RPG supplements because that's where that's where a lot of this Klingon stuff comes from, RPG supplements that he wrote for uh, the Star Trek role playing game, which he then spun off into a novel. Uh, and you know, and before that he would have been, a, I mean, he was a writer, but he before that he would have been. Uh, you know, a fan. And there's a number of people like I know B. Joe Trimble was she was a fan and she ended up working as a, I believe, what, a producer on uh, Next Generation. Um, she was involved somehow, right, Dylan? Jeez, I'm trying to remember what her actual title was. I know that she was always considered to be like fan royalty uh, and, right. and would have been. There's an aspect of this book I thought was interesting. Balkans have TV shows. Yes, or, uh, sorry, Vulcans uh, do. Klingons, Klingons, glad. Yes, said, yeah. Sorry, of course, the the Kling Klingons have TV shows. Yeah. Uh, they have a, um, a tape series that's uh, shown to young people called uh, Battle Cruiser Vengeance, with uh, the catchphrase yes. "I am Koth, Koth of Vengeance, and this ship is my prize." Um, yeah. When he conquers a, a new ship that always has a uh, Iranian female on it, that's you know the most beautiful woman ever, though apparently they're not. Yeah. They don't compare to real ones. <laughs> well, the it's, idea it's, of it, uh, a Klingon actresses in green face performing yes. Orion roles <laughs> on Klingon Star Trek, <laughs> which of course like is what problematic we have. Right? Klingons. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, they're, but they're, uh, in our context, it's not a real culture, so it's kind of okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and well, all those episodes where they, you know, surgically alter their faces to look like Romulans <laughs> and things, yeah. you know, it's a little iffy yeah. if you think about it that way, but. Uh, um, well, and then it, the joke is that Battle Cruiser Vengeance is the Klingon Star Trek, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's their Star Trek <laughs> that they enjoy. And, and at one point in the novel, a human mentions he likes Battle Cruiser Vengeance, and Kren is this huge fan of Battle Cruiser Vengeance. <laughs> so he kinda, he, he's a Star Trek nerd, so he geeks out. He's a Klingon Star Trek nerd. That was one of my favorite cute so. details about this book. Uh, I saw yeah, um, yeah. a post a while back. This is a little off topic, but uh, the idea is that Klingons would really love Dungeons & Dragons. At, to the point where, you know, everyone wants to kind of be, like, that's the most popular, for a while, it was the most popular cosplay among uh, Star Trek, the same way, you know, stormtroopers are among Star Wars. Um, and and uh, I, I feel like I'd like, that's something I'd like to see on Discovery, just make, I mean, maybe not now with what they're doing in the new season, but well, yeah, um, I did really like that Discovery makes them into, like, 
badass heavy everything is heavy metal on discovery and that and that's the correct choice for the klingons that they're heavy metal game of thrones basically there's something that i always appreciated where um it's it's sort of uh, something that i always appreciated uh there's the scene in uh next gen i think it was uh, the the teaser to yesterday's enterprise where they they knew that they couldn't have Worf in the episode because the plot wasn't going to allow it and they had um like five extra minutes that they could write for the script. And so they were like, well, let's give Worf and Guinan just a cute dialogue scene in the beginning of the episode so that Worf gets to appear on the episode mm. and we get to reintroduce viewers to Guinan, who's going to be central to the plot. And the whole subject of that basically is like, uh, Worf likes to self-apply all of his own personality traits to, this is what Klingons are like, because he's the right. only Klingon that he knows. And, uh -huh. but Guinan, who's been everywhere and has met everyone, is like, Klingons laugh. You don't laugh. Klingons are fun. You're not fun. Stop <laughs> saying that you're not fun because you're Klingon. You're not fun because you're <laughs> Worf. <laughs> right. Like, not in those yes. exact words, but. Yep. Yeah, and they even did an episode of Deep Space Nine where he kind of riffed on that, like he had a bit of a trauma in his past and that was why he was all solemn and the other Klingons tended to be merry and <laughs> bound and and uh, celebratory all the time yeah Worf is sort of because he was raised uh, um by humans basically and uh so he, he tends to idealize klingon culture in certain ways but doesn't really see them as they are often um, they never live yeah, up to his expectations that. almost ever and that and in a way that's what makes him so great at being a klingon is that mm -hmm. so imagine if if you were uh imagine if if you if your idea of America was the things that America says that it is, which is that we're for, right. you know, it, it, we're for equality of opportunity and, and we're for, you know, uh, a freedom, freedom to be who you yeah. are and fulfill your own destiny and all the stuff that we, we say that's important to us. And you never actually visited America or any of the various places where we inflict our will with military and economic uh, uh, imperialism. And then you met some Americans, and they let you down, but you were so good at being Steve Rogers that <laughs> right, you managed yeah, yeah. to actually change American politics and yep. make the actual America meet the expectations that you grew up with as a child. That's what Worf does. Worf yes, I know. Exactly. He's the Klingon Captain America. You're 100% <laughs> correct. And I love that. That is a great arc. Usually described as tolerant Earth, but when it's convenient, they're still dicks to other to other people. <laughs> yes, in the yeah, final reflection, yeah. there's an anti-Semite. The um, though yeah. he seems um pretty bigoted in general. Uh, he's a, a rich guy who wants to uh, yeah. back take all humans back to Earth. Um, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, he's he's. He He's a MAGA of the Federation, yeah. basically. Um, it's very hard to read the, char the character of uh, Maxwell Granderson, Granderson III as, as not being a, a, a contemporary Trump guy kind of mashed up with Ted Turner. Yeah. Right. And uh, there's uh, a soldier who's uh, explicitly Jewish said uh, he doesn't like her for reasons that she thought was dead. So sort of uh, pretty much outright says oh. he was anti-Semitic. Yeah, I caught that. Okay, I kind of missed that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. she said after she said that, she says uh, Lachaim, I think. So yeah. Yeah, it's she basically clear. implies that she's she's not welcome on the Grandison compound in you know, in in our distant future. Although again, the years are not established in, in this time period. But like, uh, humanity has has more or less bound together in this future of Star Trek. But you've still got classic down home anti Semitism in Georgia. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, as I say, you can, like, if you wanted to stretch it, you could say that the Kirk era was kind of the, like, they even actually talk about uh, in the course of this novel, uh, how they've uh, stumbled across um, dilithium, which they didn't really have before supposedly and then as we were uh, uh, uh as we see in next generation they have rechargeable dilithium which uh, i was saying on twitter that's kind of needed because otherwise the the federation is about you know resource extraction and <laughs> like then then you're fighting over uh, mineral rights for a planet and you get into some real problems with that kind of stuff um you can almost argue that as much as we say oh star trek's utopian and wonderful Maybe there was an evolution between Kirk's Day and Picard's Day, you know? Maybe maybe there actually was a more subtle, uh, 
you know, it, it's the, the uh, if you want to say it's space communism, that it's the Marxist idea that a lot of aspects will fade away if you if you deal with the material yeah. circumstances, I guess. Yeah, and that's why, that's um, why leftists love Star Trek, right? Uh, it, so much of yeah. it, we have to extrapolate it as we're watching, because right. with the exception of a couple of, uh, a couple of lines of dialogue here or there in TOS and DS9, um, mm -hmm. we they're not they're not really that explicit about how the economy works and how that related to humanity evolving into right. this this thing that we should aspire to be on Star Trek, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's right. the there's the the missing piece there which we as fans have to kind of uh, create for ourselves, and that's and that's cool, and it, it's it's both cool and disappointing, right? Because right. it's not it's not there. There's only one way from our perspective here in the year 2020 that we can imagine filling that gap, and that is that creating a a post scarcity economy and addressing the ills of poverty directly with the means available, which are available now, but sure with replicators will be easier. Um, Will, will lead to us moving past the other things that make us suck as a species. But right. they, that one, that, they're willing to say A and C, but they never quite give you B, and we have to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you have to accept that just for Star Trek, because, like, as we said, they can't, if they knew, they would solve society's problems instead of running a TV show. Yeah, but and they yeah, certainly you have to... wouldn't get aired on CBS. <laughs> yeah, and you have to just sort of accept that, yeah, it's 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 a it's a conversation that Star Trek has been having for 50 years of between, well, this is good, no, this is bad. <laughs> so when you see something in Star Trek that you go, oh, you know, that, that's ba that creates an underlying problem for all of Star Trek, you have to be able to sort of toss it out or rationalize it or, or fan wank it away and, <laughs> and turn it into something else. And they'll, what, chances are pretty good there'll be another Star Trek episode that kind of answers that concern further down the line. So It's like each ship in the fleet is a Death Star. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, you could have, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing where you could say, but the Federation is great. Yeah. But you fly around with Death Stars. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly the thing where you can say, we've been seeing it from their perspective all this time mm -hmm. and we're told how great they are, but what about dot, dot, dot. That's the know. thing that's so, great about this book is that you are forced to look at the United Federation of Planets from the lens of somebody who, who doesn't live there and says, uh, you got a lot of guns, son. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make us feel great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's that's uh, that's they they do definitely Ford definitely wrote it as sort of you know maybe we should challenge our perception of uh, the Federation and stuff. Like uh, that. There's also um, in Klingon culture they they don't actually call themselves the Empire in their language in this book. Uh, the idea is there's right. two kinds of societies: those that grow and those that contract. And they're not sure what the Federation is at this point. Right. And the Federation and is in the text dealing with that same question, right? Because you have Starfleet and you mm -hmm. have the, the, the United Federation of Planets, which is sort of on the teetering on the edge of potential dissolution. That is, right. that has uh, the, the faction that ultimately wins the day that says we will continue to expand. And then you have the sort of Earth, the, uh, the back to Earth movement led by Maxwell Grandison III, who thinks that it's time to contract. And Kren kind of makes their decision for them. Because he could right. have let either outcome happen. And it's interesting that the outcome that he chooses is the one that maybe does not best suit um, the Klingon Empire. Uh, as I imagine that the contraction of the Federation might serve them their own expansion, right? But I think, I, sub I imagine, we haven't even talked about the character of Dr. Emmanuel Tagore, but like his friend, his Earth friend, who is smarter than a lot of his colleagues and gets and is textually set up as the guy who's right all the time. Um, uh, sort of seems to know what's best for us in the text and he follows sort of what he thinks that he would do and would approve of. Right. Yeah, he's, he's, he basically, this is a human he respects. And, uh, and I mean, part, it should be noted, a big thing of what Kren is doing is essentially uh, revenge against the Klingons who killed his uh, adopted father. Um, in some ways, it's I'm willing to like it's revealed by the end. I'm willing to sort of 
shackles on the empire if it means these jerks who i don't like (laughs) are going to suffer as a result of it basically um so and that's to you know to establish how they're in detente 40 years before uh the events of the original series but it's it it, you know it's he's playing it all like a giant game of klinza or chess if you like um which is kind of an interesting way of putting it um, there's one last thing I did want to mention, uh, because we were talking about this idea of whether, uh, whether, uh, Star Trek was the future or not. And we've talked about how, like, it really is this giant fan contraption more than really any other, except maybe Marvel comics, um, at the time, uh, it was like an edifice created by the fans as much as it was by the quote professionals and the, and the, the, the official stuff. Um, and one of the things that I always find fascinating about it is Roddenberry himself, because as we were saying at the beginning, he was a bit of a, you know, he had some problems, um, a lot of problems, really. Not a great guy. Uh, and even some of his ideas for Star Trek wouldn't have been great if he, we'd taken him that seriously. But in a weird thing that happened, like he was literally an L.A. cop. Uh, who was an ex-Navy guy, uh, it's kind of amazing that he turned out as, you know, progressive as he did. In um, short, if but, he was around today, we would smoke his ass online. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but what's crazy about it is, though, like, fans read into ne- uh, the original series. As we said, the original series has a lot to indicate that it's not really that, like, they haven't necessarily done away with money. It's not quite as wonderful and utopian as we might try to characterize it on the left, um, just that it's, quote, good, unquote. Um, but at, over the years, people read into it all this various stuff like, oh, yeah, they'd done away with greed and hunger. They'd, you know, they're, they're, they're dealing with the U.S. imperialism in maybe a more reflective kind of way. And because the audience accepted that, Roddenberry, because he liked the fans so much and he was basing so much of his persona on the fans, he seems to have embraced that. And it was almost, it's this weird thing where the grift became real. <laughs> like, it's, like, he kind of just embraced better politics because it helped his career and and he seems to have had some legitimate i i don't know who knows what to say but like i say when you read what he's talking about in the 80s he's almost become this weird techno communist like i don't even know how to describe his politics (laughs) by the 80s but they're very far out from where he started in a in a really interesting way so it reminds me of uh i mean bombing the idea of uh changing somebody's politics by like when they start to sort of lean your way like send like lots of love to them so they feel good and they sort of been yeah and it's usually done by cults and stuff but it's sort of interesting like um he, yeah this is a guy who's is an arrogant guy and uh people came up to him and said you're a genius i love how leftist this is yeah leftist yeah <laughs> and he started to yeah buy his own. exactly yeah yeah it's it's and it, it this happened to you know to to it's happened to people who've run cults too like it's the idea of you're running a cult and you kind of get suckered into it as much as anyone else because you have to you have to hold up a mask for so long that it becomes your persona uh in this case this is a rare example of it being done arguably for good (laughs) in a way that it didn't before but uh anyway it's it is fascinating to me that that you know that that it's been such a transformative show and franchise despite often being run by people who really just wanted to make a lot of money and had and of course they they referenced that in uh First, con- the movie First Contact, where uh, where um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the uh, ah, the guy who invents warp drive. Zephram um, Cochran. Cochran. Uh, Ze- Zephram Cochran. Yeah. So he flat out says, "No, I'm in this to make money. I don't care about space travel and all this stuff. It's just I would make a lot of money if I invented this." And he does it, and then people explain to him, "No, you see, you are going to save humanity by doing this." <laughs> and it kind of he it, you can see it affects him, and he's like, "Oh my God, I'm the savior of humanity, and all I wanted to do is make a few bucks." And that's clearly a commentary, I think, on Roddenberry. I think they are definitely uh, they're definitely or Star Trek itself that that that's where it's coming from. It's started with the basest you know uh outlook and lying in the gutter looking up at the stars as they say um so i'm gonna wrap up yeah we're kind of hitting a, a late point if there's any absolutely crucial thing to say does anyone have nope. anything uh if anybody here is uh still listening uh, i feel like listeners of this podcast would enjoy a project uh, by my friend mike duquette called um hollywood and spine uh, where he, it's an email newsletter where he writes about uh, novelizations of Hollywood films. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, oh, I'll have to listen to that then because that's, 
we don't always talk about novelizations. To be clear, we talk if you do, if you weren't aware, Dylan. I'm sure. No, but I, I know that. Like, if you're if if this is for you, if this was for you, if you made it this far <laughs> into this into this epic that we've just recorded for your entertainment, you might enjoy Hollywood and Spine. It's usually a pretty short read. Arrives in your email. Uh, I would say I think it's about uh, every every uh, I think it's uh, every two two weeks right now. Just like us. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. Nice. Well, we've blown up the tyrannical computer and thrown civilization into chaos, so it's time to head out at Warp Factor 5. We are Dahar Master, Adam Prosser, and Thought Admiral, Philip Rice, and we were joined by Dylan Roth, who has acquitted himself with honor in the eyes of his ancestors. Uh, thanks, as always, to Operations Officer Alex Ross, our engineer and producer, and Jack Fierick, composer of Klingon Opera, for our theme song. Uh, don't forget that you can listen to the show a week early, and in this case, listen to a much longer, expanded edit of the show by subscribing to our Patreons. Just search for Adam Prosser or Philip Rice at Patreon, or check the links on the website at NeverSleepsNetwork slash series slash what dash mad dash universe. We're also on social media, including Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube on Philip's channel, and on Twitter at WMU Podcast. Philip is SpearHalfOck underscore, and I'm Prankster36 on Twitter. Uh, Dylan, what's your Twitter handle? Yeah, you can find me at Dylan Roth. That's D Y L A N R O T H. Right. And you wanted to. Was there anything else you wanted to plug for yourself personally? Uh, I couldn't ever hurt to mention that I'm a member of the band The Hell Yeah Babies, uh, typically playing shows in New York and, and touring around this half of the country. Uh, currently under quarantine like everybody else, but you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you listen to music. Sounds good. Yes, they're great. Uh, one final thing I wanted to mention, um, as you heard at the beginning of the show, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, What Mad Universe is now a member of the Greenlit Podcast Network, which means we'll now be running ads. So uh, check out some of the other shows on the network at greenlitpodcasts.com. Uh, there's some good shows there. Uh, I, I'm still looking at some of them, but uh, it's well worth your time. And uh, you'll be hearing uh, from them from now on on What Mad Universe. Um, so, until next time, live long and prosper! <laughs> <laughs>